Hello and welcome to our webinar on using bank records and family history research. My name is Ginevra Morse. I oversee the education and online programs uh, here at American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society. I will be moderating today's event. We are a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history and we are pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. I do want to note that we are broadcasting from home with various limitations and distractions. We do apologize in advance if there are any interruptions from our end, and we thank you for your patience. Um, even if we were to lose the connection for any reason, you will still have access to a full recording of the presentation uh, on our website. So our presenter today is Eileen Peranti, genealogist of the Newbury Street Press. Eileen graduated with a BA from St. Anselm College and received an MS from American University. She has written several articles for American Ancestors magazine and participated in our research tours to Belfast and Dublin, Ireland uh, in 2018 and 2019. Eileen Eileen's areas of expertise include Irish, Scottish, and 19th century New England research. I would say that she's also an expert in and proponent of thinking outside the box for your family history research and exploring underutilized resources. And of course, historical bank records are certainly an underutilized and overlooked resource for family historians. So in today's session, Eileen will look at the types of records that exist and what information they provide using three banks really as examples. And those three banks are the Emigrant Savings Bank, the Freedman Savings and Trust, and Provident Institution for Saving. Uh, then she'll provide suggestions on how to find the bank that your ancestor may have used um, anywhere really across the country. So at any point during the presentation, feel free to type your question into the panel to the right of your screen. We'll address those at the end. There is a syllabus for this session that can be purchased from our online bookstore. You'll find a link to this downloadable PDF in your reminder emails, as well as in your follow-up email, uh, which I'll be sending out later today after today's live broadcast. We are also recording this event, and starting tomorrow, you can freely go back and review any of the content from the presentation on our website. So if you miss something on today's first listen, don't worry. You can always go back, watch, rewatch uh, as many times as you like the presentation. All right, so without further ado, I will turn things over to Eileen. Thank you, Geneva, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Eileen Peranti. I've worked here at NEHGS for eight years, the first few years in the Research Services Department and currently with the Books and Journals team at the Newberry Street Press. Like pretty much everyone else participating in this webinar today, occasionally I hit a brick wall while conducting genealogical research. And when this happens, I like to think outside the box and try to identify a lesser used record set to try and find the answers I am after. One set of records that may help you break down that brick wall in your own research are, is bank records. One reason why these records may be overlooked is because people assume their ancestors had very little money so that it would be unlikely they would have bank accounts. However, these savings banks were established to provide services for those very people. So it is worth taking the time to learn more about these records. So today, I'm going to provide examples of the type of information contained in records from three banking institutions, the Immigrant Savings Bank, the Freedman's Savings and Trust Bank, and the Provident Institution for Savings. Then I'll talk a little bit on strategies for identifying a bank your ancestor may have used. It may take some digging to achieve success with banking records, but it is definitely worth the effort due to the amount of details contained in these records. The savings bank movement can be traced back to a Scottish bank founded by minister and social reformer, Reverend Henry Duncan in the village of Ruthwell, Dumfries, Scotland in 1810. As a teenager, his father sent him to Liverpool to study and work in the banking field. But after a few years, he decided to focus on the ministry instead. 
He worked to help the poor in his community, employing men to work on his farm and supplying area women with flax for spinning. His aim was to provide them with a sense of pride and independence in becoming self-sufficient, but he felt more could be done. So drawing upon his experience in the banking field, he worked to develop a bank to encourage the poorer members of the community to save money. Receiving support from area landowners who also saw the benefit of their poorer neighbors becoming more self-sufficient, Duncan opened the first savings bank in Ruthwell in 1810. A person only needed to deposit six pence, which comes out to about 46 cents today in, um, when you do the conversion, in order to open an account. These deposits were placed at the Linen Bank in Dumfries, earning 5% interest. The account holders received 4% interest, with the remaining funds accrued placed into a charitable fund. Witnessing the success of this program, Duncan worked to have other areas throughout Scotland adopt the idea of establishing savings banks in their communities by giving speeches and publishing pamphlets about these banks. And within a few years, savings banks were established throughout the United Kingdom and Europe. The idea of establishing savings banks soon spread to the United States. The first two savings banks in the United States were located in Boston and in Philadelphia. The Provident Institute for Savings was incorporated in Boston, Massachusetts in 1816. And I will talk about their records in a little bit. The Philadelphia Savings Fund Society also opened its doors in 1816 but was not incorporated until 1819. Over the next few years, additional savings banks were established in cities like Providence, Baltimore, and Hartford. The Immigrant Savings Bank, which I will talk about momentarily, was established in 1850, and the Freedmen's Savings and Trust was established in 1865. So I'm going to begin with some background information about the Immigrant Savings Bank. The Irish Immigrant Society was established in 1841 in New York City by a group of Irish American merchants. Its aim was to assist Irish immigrants as they arrived in America. This need stemmed from a rise in the number of immigrants arriving in New York starting in the 1830s. Even before the famine in the 1840s, many were leaving Ireland for the United States, settling in Eastern cities such as Boston, New York, and Philadelphia. Many were unskilled workers who found it difficult to secure jobs, leaving them and their families living in poverty. A number of successful Irish American merchants worked to come up with a way to help their fellow Irish men and women. From this need, arose the Irish Immigrant Society. As soon as the immigrants arrived by ship, members of the society made themselves available to help with housing and created an employment bureau to try and help place individuals in decent jobs. Another way they assisted these immigrants is through the establishment of the Immigrant Savings Bank in 1850. Bishop John Hughes of New York approached the members of the Irish Immigrant Society and asked that they establish a savings bank for Irish immigrants. Since the society worked to help immigrants acclimate to their new lives in America, creating a savings bank for that population would provide them with a way to form good savings habits. The Immigrant Savings Bank was established in April of 1850, and the first deposits were accepted in September of that year. The bank was located at 51 Chambers Street in Manhattan. And during its early years, the bank was open Monday through Saturday between 5 p.m. and 7 p.m. This was to accommodate for people who were working during the day, they'd still be able to come and make the deposits after work. Within seven years of opening, there were approximately 5,500 accounts at that bank. An incentive for the immigrant population to use this bank was the offer of a higher interest rate for accounts containing less than $500. 
Cormac O'Grata, author of an article titled The Famine, the New York Irish, and their bank, provided some interesting information on the occupations held by some of the bank's earliest customers. Approximately one quarter of the first 204 men to open accounts listed their occupation as unskilled laborers. Among the earliest female account holders, 48 of the original 94 customers were domestics, and an additional 19 held various jobs pertaining to clothes making. Other occupations included boarding housekeeper, factory worker, peddler, carpenter, coffee roaster, and shoemaker. Prior to the opening of the Immigrant Savings Bank, members of the Irish Immigrant Society assisted immigrants with sending money back to their families in Ireland throughout the 1840s. This continued with the establishment of the Savings Bank. The illustration on this slide is from Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper dated March 13, 1880. It is titled, quote, New York City, Irish depositors of the Emigrant Savings Bank withdrawing money to send to their suffering relatives in the old country, end quote. Many immigrants would send money or even prepaid tickets to encourage other family members to follow them in leaving Ireland and settling in the United States. As the Immigrant Savings Bank grew in the 1850s, its customers were not limited to only Irish immigrants and Irish Americans. By the start of the 20th century, the bank's employees included a number of people able to speak a variety of languages to accommodate its customers. So what makes these bank records a valuable resource for those researching their ancestors? Unlike today, where we use documents such as our driver's license or pa passport for identification, banks like the Emigrant Savings Bank recorded details about the customer in order to identify the patron when processing transactions. The information recorded to identify the patron included details such as his or her address, place of birth, names of parents and or spouse, names and locations of any siblings, the year of immigration, and even sometimes the name of the ship they sailed on when they immigrated. Maiden names were also recorded on these documents. The Immigrant Savings Bank index books contain the name of the customer and the account number. This account number is helpful when searching for additional bank records pertaining to a particular patron. The index book database available through Ancestry.com contains entries covering the years 1850 through 1880. Now when searching these index books on Ancestry.com, the listing also provides a link to the associated records in the test book and or the transfer signature in test books, as noted with that red arrow above. The test books provide details that help to identify the customer, such as residence, occupation, family names and relationships, birth and immigration information. It is important to note that the years covered in the test books whether you're searching the Ancestry database or the microfilms available through NEHGS or the Family History Library, date from 1850 through 1868. Several of the volumes were likely lost over the years. Now the transfer signature and test books note any changes to the customer's information, including change of address and details about any individuals who may end up taking over the account. Now, these books date from 1850 through 1883. So even though the test books only run through 1868, it is still worthwhile checking the source for accounts from the 1870s and early 1880s in the event you locate an item in the transfer signature and test books. Now, for this example, we're going to look at an account holder named Thomas Sullivan. When we click on the link shown on this slide, 
it brings us to the page containing the test book entry for Thomas Sullivan's account. So this test book entry contains details about, about Thomas Sullivan that are very useful for anyone researching Thomas and his family. This entry reads, quote, Thomas Sullivan for his daughter, Mary Ann Sullivan. Between the words Thomas and Sullivan, you'll see an X where he marked the entry, which indicates that he could not write. His address is listed as 204 Hester Street and his occupation was Taylor. Other information includes his year of birth, which was 1827, and his birthplace, which was the townland of Kenmare in County Kerry, Ireland. Also, according to this entry, he arrived in the United States in 1853 on the ship Florida. His wife was Catherine Breen, and they had three children. Another notation written on this entry is, quote, in case of death, wishes his daughter Margaret to get money. Thomas Sullivan opened an account with the Emigrant Savings Bank a year after this census was taken in 1860. It is noted on his bank account entry that he had three children, which meant a third child was born shortly after the census was enumerated. Listed in this household is his wife, Catherine, and young daughters, Mary Ann, who's listed on the bank account, and Margaret. Based on this information, Thomas opened a bank account for his daughters. It was in his name and his daughter, Mary Ann's name, but in the event of Mary Ann's death, the money in the account would go to his younger daughter, Margaret. Another example is this test book entry for a woman named Ellen Brown. It provides a wealth of information about Ellen. Her occupation was washer and ironer, and her father, Thomas Early, and mother, Anne Golden, were both deceased by 1851. Her husband, John Brown, was also deceased. She was a native of Drumley Parish, and it is even noted in this entry that this parish is about three miles from Ballinamore, County Leitrim, Ireland. Other identifiable details include the names and residences of several half-siblings, as well as the names of Ellen's three children. Now, these details could potentially prove useful when researching her family's Irish origins, as well as tracing her movements once she arrived in America. Because the test books were for recording identifiable information about the account holder, various details are listed in these books, including the example above. It was taken from an entry dated November of 1850 for account holder Edward Lennon. According to this entry, Lennon was a fruit peddler who hailed from Edgeworthstown, County Longford, Ireland. An additional notation was added which stated that Lennon was blind in his right eye. Now, for those conducting Irish research, entries like the one in this example can be extremely helpful in determining someone else's place of birth in Ireland. However, although the Immigrant Savings Bank was established with Irish immigrants in mind, People from a variety of countries were customers, which, as noted earlier, resulted in hiring staff fluent in other languages. So even if your ancestor was not Irish, it is definitely worth checking out the records to see if he or she may have been an account holder at this banking institution. The transfer, signature, and test books note any changes to the customer's information, including change of address and details about individuals who may end up taking over the account. While reviewing these records, I came across an entry for a husband and wife with a notation that no money can be released to the wife unless both individuals sign off on the request. Another entry notes special instructions for dealing with one woman's money, stating that she was, quote, crazy and a resident at an area hospital. 
Now, a detail like this may help resolve a question a researcher has regarding the whereabouts of a particular individual whose trail had gone cold. So where are these records located? The New England Historic Genealogical Society's library has a collection of microfilm records pertaining to the Immigrant Savings Bank. The contents include meeting minutes of the Irish Immigrant Society's Board of Trustees and Finance, Finance Committee, in addition to the index, test, and transfer signature and test books. Now currently, our library is open to visitors with limited capacity by appointment only on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays between 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. If you wish to visit our library to review this microfilm collection, you may schedule an appointment online through our website. The record examples I've been using are from the Ancestry.com database, New York Emigrant Savings Bank Records, 1850 to 1883. When using this database, one can either search by name or browse by record book type or year. One item of note regarding the browse feature for this collection on Ancestry, if you choose to browse the test books, you may notice that there are several items dated from the 1900s. Those are actually misindexed. For instance, the years 1954 through 1958 are actually 1854 through 1858. The print on the original record is very small, which likely led to this confusion when they were indexed. The catalog for the Family History Library is available online at familysearch.org. If you search their catalog, you'll find a list of microfilm held at the library associated with this collection under the heading Emigrant Savings Bank Records, 1841-1945. Pre-1850 records in this collection are the minutes of the Board of Trustees for the Irish Immigrant Society, like they are with the collection at NEHGS. This collection covers records through 1945. A number of the records that date from the late 1800s and early 1900s are bond and mortgage records, as well as some real estate loans. Note that the library does not conduct interlibrary loan of microfilm anymore. So you would have to visit the library in Salt Lake City to review these records. Furthermore, at last check, the Family History Library is still closed due to the, pan due to the pandemic, but continue to check their website for updates. Another online source for these records is the New York Public Library Digital Collections, which has a selection of digitized record books from the Immigrant Savings Bank, as well as several photographs and illustrations of the bank. Their website is located at digitalcollections.nypl.org. I did not cover mortgage or loan records in this webinar, but if you are interested in taking a look at some of these records from the Immigrant Savings Bank collection, there are a few digitized items available on this website. A microfilmed version of these records are located in the New York Public Library Manuscripts and Archives Division. Next, I would like to talk about the Freedmen Savings and Trust Records. This bank was established on March 3rd, 1865 through an act signed by President Lincoln to provide assistance for African-American soldiers as well as newly freed slaves. There were 37 branches of this bank located in the following states, Alabama, Arkansas, District of Columbia, Florida, Georgia, Kentucky, Louisiana, Maryland, Mississippi, Missouri, New York, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Tennessee, and Virginia. The records from 29 of these branches have survived. As with the Emigrant Savings Bank records, the documents associated with the Freeman Savings and Trust contain a wealth of information. In, 17, in 1872, Frederick Douglass was asked to be the bank's director in the Washington, D.C. branch. 
However, as he settled into this role, he discovered that a variety of issues, including overexpansion and the mismanagement of funds, left the Freedmen's Bank in financial trouble. He made an attempt to stabilize the bank by investing his own money in it, but it was not enough to keep it open. And unfortunately, the bank closed in 1874. It was a disaster for many who learned that their savings was gone. Now, as with the immigrant savings bank records, the information provided in these documents provide a number of details to help identify the account holder, including place and date of birth, residence, names of relatives, occupation, and in some cases, even the name of his or her former owner and the name of the plantation. Here's an example of an application filed with the Missouri branch dated 1866 that provides detailed information about account holder John Henry Dorsey. It is noted that he was an unmarried carpenter whose parents were both still living. Their names and residence are included on the application. And it is also noted that John was born in Charles County, Maryland. This particular record also lists the name and location of his former owner, Thomas Maddox. Now here's another interesting record. Part of a set of records for a branch in Washington, DC for the year 1869. Austin Richard, age 31, opened an account on January 22nd, 1869. He was married with three children and worked as a farmer. His mother was alive and living in New Orleans, but it is noted that his father died in the army. These details provide some wonderful leads for those researching this family. This gentleman's application from South Carolina dates from 1871. It is noted that he was born at Ladies Island in Beaufort County, South Carolina, and he was 26 of age. He was married and his only child died at the age of four months. His mother was alive and living at Ladies Island, but his father died when he was five years of age. His brother was a resident of Savannah, Georgia, and his sister Sarah died around 1876. This next example, is an application for Jenny Slade Sneed, filed in the Washington DC branch in 1868. It is noted that she was 32 years of age, a widow with several children who are named on the record. Uh, the interesting fact is when asked where she was born, she answered that she didn't know, but thought it was on, quote, Dr. Hawkins's plantation in Florida. So how does one locate these records? The Freedman Savings and Trust records are available online and on microfilm. FamilySearch.org and Ancestry.com have databases pertaining to these records, both covering the years 1865 through 1874. Microfilm copies of these records are held at the National Archives and Records Administration. If you wish to review the items in this collection, it is recommended to check NARA's website for up-to-date information regarding the ability to, of visitors to access the facilities. One item of note regarding the Family Search and Ancestry databases is that you have the option of searching by name or browsing the collection by choosing a set of records for a particular state and review it page by page. As you can see from the two arrows, the column on the right that shows the different roles that you could browse through. Browsing through a particular set of records can prove to be beneficial on the off chance a surname you are researching is misspelled. Next, I'm gonna be talking about the Provident Institution for Savings Records. 
This bank was established in Boston in 1816. It was the first incorporated savings bank in the United States. And the goal of its founders was to, quote, encourage thrift and self-improvement of the poor of Boston without subjecting them to the so-called moral corruption associated with outright charity, end quote. It continued under the name of Provident Institution for Savings until 1993, when it merged with Shawmut Bank, which was later bought out by Fleet Financial, and most recently, Bank of America. The building on the right of this photograph is the former location of the Provident Institution for Savings on Tremont Street in Boston from 1833 to 1856. A set of guidelines regarding accounts and trustee roles was written in the signature book dated 1836, providing a snapshot of how the bank was run at that time. The smallest deposit allowed was $1 and the smallest amount put on for interest was $5. Among the records of the Provident Institution for Savings are the signature books. Now, although the early signature books contain only the name of the account holder and the account number, starting in the 1840s and early 1850s, the information provided in these books become much more detailed. Although, while the early books do not have as much detail as the later books, you may still find useful information in some of the entries, as noted in this example, which include the ages of several account holders. Here's another interesting item noted in an early signature book entry dated 1840. Some signatures, like we saw with Thomas Sullivan, are simply marked with an X, which typically indicates that an account holder could not write. However, for Sarah Glines's entry above, although she signed with an X, it is noted that she did not write her name, quote, in consequence of a lame hand. Other interesting details about female account holders may be obtained from these records. For this example, next to the original listing of account holder Sam Bradford is the information about an individual named Annie Bradford. Presumably, she was included in the listing because she was a family member who was allowed to access the account or who possibly took over the account after Sam's death. Additional details about Annie include a notation about her birthplace, which was Philadelphia, her marital status, she was single, her address, and her age. In the second example on this slide, it is noted that account holder Betsy Lewis was from Hingham and that she was born in Harwich, England. As noted earlier, by the 1850s, the signature books became more detailed. This example contains some fantastic information about the account holders, such as their birthplace. It includes Cork, Roscommon, Germany, St. John's, etc. Also includes current address and occupation. For some married female account holders, the names of their husbands are provided. Some entries provide the actual name of the business where they are employed in addition to their occupation. And I came across a few listings for house servants and domestics that actually list the name of the family who employed them. In addition to the signature books, the Provident Institution for Savings Collection includes waste books which is similar to signature books. The daily transactions were jotted down in these waste books and the information would be then copied into a more permanent volume for record keeping purposes. Like the signature books, the waste books contain details such as addresses and occupations, but also have information about the deposits made. In this example, the account holders name, town or city of residence, 
occupation and date of deposit was made are included. So where are these records available? The Boston Athenaeum has among its holdings a manuscript collection titled Provident Institution for Savings in the Town of Boston Records, 1816 to 1895. A finding aid for this collection is available on the Athenaeum's website. There are a number of items, including annual reports, newspaper articles about the bank, and correspondence related to banking affairs in this collection, along with the account records. The New England Historic Genealogical Society has partnered with the Boston Athenaeum to create a searchable database of signature and waste book records with images. Just this week, NEHGS placed online the first of the six signature books that will be included in the database. It covers entries dating from May 17, 1854 to June 9, 1858, and it has approximately 380 pages. NEHGS also placed online in this database the first of six waste books. This volume covers entries dating from March 1st, 1821 to June 5th, 1822. And as each volume is completed, that book will become available online on this database. When this project is complete, the database will contain details from 12 volumes, six signature books, and six waste books containing over 4,000 pages. Different options are available for searching this database. One can search by name, year, an account holder's place of birth, or even the names of family members, such as parents or spouse, when those details are provided on the original document. As you can see in this screenshot, Another option is to use the Browse This Database box located on the right-hand side. By clicking on the blue Browse button, which will take you to a page where you can then choose the type of book and volume to scroll through. Regarding this Browse feature, as more volumes are added to this database, one will be able to click the Volume box at the top of the screen, which will drop down and you'll be able to choose the volume you wish to browse. Now, in this example, a search of the name Michael Sullivan yields a number of results, including an 1854 signature book entry for Michael Sullivan, a resident of Newton Upper Falls, Massachusetts. His birthplace is listed as County Clare, Ireland. Another fantastic detail provided is his occupation. It is listed as farming for Jesse Winslow. A lot of times when we see on things like uh, city directories and census records, it might just say laborer, farmer, at least this gives more specific information that might help you out with your research on this individual. Another result for the name Michael Sullivan not shown on this screenshot was for Michael Sullivan of Boston birthplace Waterford, Ireland, occupation laborer at Kinsley's Plaster Factory. Another example of how uh, sometimes if we just see laborer on one record, this type of record provides much more detailed information. This entry dated August 9, 1854, pertains to Patrick O'Regan of Boston. He was born in County Cork, Ireland, and he worked at the Hammond Pierce Company stables. Another interesting identifiable characteristic listed for Patrick is that, quote, this man stutters. As you can imagine, this indexing project is quite the undertaking. If you would like to help with this project, you can contact Rachel Adams, the Database Services Volunteer Coordinator, at the email listed on the screen. You do not need to come to the library in order to volunteer, but rather work from home on your own computer. If you would like to learn more about how to volunteer for this project, Rachel can answer any questions you may have. 
Okay, so how does one find information about a particular bank? It's wonderful to have collections like the Immigrant Savings Bank, Freedman Savings and Trust, and Provident Institution for Savings Bank records available online and on microfilm. However, you'll likely need to do a little bit of digging to identify bank records for your research. But do not be discouraged by that, for there are certain sources out there that may help you in your search for these records. A number of our ancestors settled in major cities across the United States, so it may feel like you're looking for a needle in a haystack when searching for banks that were operational in the city during your ancestors' lifetime. So here are a few suggestions on how to try and narrow down the number of banks to focus on for your research. One source that may provide some clues is the city directory. One can find a number of bank listings in city directories. Many are in the form of advertisements, which oftentimes contain details such as the year it was established and the types of services offered. A check of the addresses of the bank may reveal that it was located in close proximity to where your ancestor lived or worked. Additionally, the names of some banks changed over time, as you saw when I noted with Provident Institution for Savings. So looking at the names of banks in a directory where your ancestor is listed can help you determine what name the bank went by during that time frame. Here's another example of a city directory listing for a bank, this one in the San Francisco area. Details in this listing include the year it was incorporated and the location of the bank. Now this is an entry from the 1905 San Francisco city directory. This particular directory contains a series of, so of short sketches, if you will, of the banks in the area, such as the above entry for the Italian American Bank. The details in this listing include the incorporation date, location, the names of the president, vice president, and directors. I always take the time to conduct a thorough review of city directories because you may find some unexpected and valuable information in it. Another source to check is probate records. You may be able to identify the name of the bank used by an ancestor through inventories, wills, and other probate documents. Be sure to check any probate documents you locate for other relatives as well, for they may have used the same bank for transactions. Now, your ancestor may not have resided in a city such as Chicago or New York, but instead settled in a less populated area. One suggestion is to look for town or county histories to learn more about the community where your ancestor resided. It may provide you with details regarding the establishment of an area bank, as well as other particulars that will help you with your research. A number of these books are available online through websites such as Google Books. Additionally, it is worth looking at local newspapers for details about banks in the area, especially if it's located in a neighboring town. If you're conducting a page-by-page -page search of a newspaper, it may be more challenging to find information on area banks, but be sure to check the advertisements because you may come across it in that section of the newspaper. In addition to town and county histories, be sure to check for anniversary pamphlets or other publications pertaining to the history of certain banks. A number of these are available online, but also check local libraries for other books for this for books of this nature, which are not usually available online. Examples from the Family Search catalog include Oldest Bank in Arkansas, the McElroy Bank of Fayetteville, Arkansas the 100th anniversary of the Orange National Bank, 1828 to 1928, and the second National Bank of Phillipsburg since 1900, 61 years of progress. To try and locate bank records and other material held in area repositories, one suggestion is to conduct a search of records for a particular geographic area 
to narrow down your search. Archive Grid, and you'll see the web address listed up on the screen there, is one way to determine what types of records may prove to be beneficial for your research. When I simply type in bank records for a search, I get a wide variety of items on the results page. But here are two items that my search captured, the Woburn Five Cents Savings Bank Records and Farmers and Citizen Bank Records from Kansas. Included in the entry is the name of the repository where the manuscript items are located, a short description of the contents of the collection, and a link for contact information to a staff member. Taking a closer look at the contents of the Woburn Five Cent Savings Bank records, I learned that it is stored off-site, which alerts me to contact staff to see how far in advance I need to order the records for review. It also provides a better breakdown of the contents, which include board meeting minutes, customer records dating from 1854 to 1906, and alphabetical indexes by name. Also noted on this results page is a link to the finding aid for this collection, which will help me order the correct boxes and folders in the collection ahead of my visit. I just have a few more tips for researching these records. Do not hesitate to ask staff members at libraries and archives where these collections are held to find out if other materials are held in additional locations. Also, it may seem tedious, but when you have the opportunity to browse the contents of a collection instead of simply conducting a name search, do so. It will provide you with the opportunity to review the records for documents pertaining to other relatives and friends. And last, do not be intimidated at the prospect of trying to navigate these records. There may not always be an index and there may be gaps in what is available, but it is worth taking the time to review these materials. Thank you, Eileen, for that great presentation. Let's pause here and see if you have any questions. Go ahead and type your questions into the panel to the right of your screen, and we'll try to get to as many as we can in the time provided. Um, so Nancy asks, did Irish immigrants in Philadelphia have access to the Immigrant Savings Bank in New York City? I mean, would you, are you likely to find only folks living in New York City kind of in those test books, or might people really travel to have an account there? I think what I would do is, um, in that instance with Philadelphia, um, the uh, item uh, that I mentioned that uh, the bank in Philadelphia that was established in 1816. I would try those records first, and then you could see um, if they expand. It might be a situation where they have a relative that's um, that has an account in New York, possibly, and that they're listed on the account. Uh, they might not necessarily have, um, you know, be an account holder, or it could be a situation where they previously lived in New York and, um, you know, prior to living in Philadelphia. So. I would try both, give it a shot. Because like I said, they could have had a, a sibling or a, um, another relative who was an account holder at the Immigrant Savings Bank and they listed them as um, part of their identifiable information. And you showed an example of you know, researching rural areas um, and some suggestions on how to go about that. Uh, Evelyn does ask, you know, she has ancestors in the 1800s who are living in rural areas of Ohio. Um, would, and you suggested looking at local histories, um, but do you also suggest kind of looking at neighborhoods or towns or the closest city um, as well? I mean, how far should you kind of broaden your, your search? I think um, one of the great things about digging into town and county histories is to learn more about how they functioned during a particular time frame. So you may discover that that there might not have been a bank in close proximity at all, um, and that it might have been um, 
there might have been some other type of establishment in that area during that time that kind of helped with transactions or it might give you a little bit more background about what the individuals did during that time frame but i would certainly not limit yourself to that particular town i would uh spread it out to other areas um in that area uh take a look at a map and see what other communities were established during that time frame and kind of widen the search. You know, it is possible that it could have been somebody who lived in one town and did a lot of um, business transactions, whether they were selling their goods or, you know, um, products from their farms and that it might have been five, 10 miles away. And maybe possibly they uh, had a bank account in that particular town. So. I would uh, try to widen your search if you can't find anything in the immediate area. And uh, Lynn asks, are banks like Bank of America, which have acquired older banks, making records available as a general rule? Or is the Provident Bank um, an exception? You know, would our local bank, for example, open records that were a century or so old for research? So that's where it's good to check archive grid to get a feel, uh, it varies. I mean, there might be some records that are lost. There might be some records that are still held. Uh, some of the larger institutions might have an established archives within their um, company, and they might have those records from the uh, former banks that they you know, eventually um, took over. So I, I think it's more a matter of um, digging in, trying to pinpoint uh, a number of banks and then trying to contact, you know, even if a particular bank in an area is um, no longer around, I would check local libraries and archives and see if they are familiar. Um, a lot of places have local history rooms and they have a wide variety of items. So they might be able to help track down details about that particular bank and, and get you an answer. Right, so certainly not a general rule uh, that these materials are, are coming available. And I think it's worth mentioning too, I mean, for the Provident Institution of Savings that we mentioned, that was a manuscript collection that had been donated to the Boston Athenaeum. So even though Bank of America eventually, you know, kind of took over what would have been the Provident Institution of Savings, um, it, it, it's not... Bank of America who's making those records public, they had already been kind of sourced out and donated to a local repository. So, uh, you know, it, it's really historical societies and um, other archives that I think are really kind of holding these valuable materials. I mean, would you agree, Eileen, or add anything to that? Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that's, that's part of the hunt is, um, you know, you're not sure of uh, when the particular bank took over, what was determined to stay within the company and what might have been donated prior to it. Um, you know, that's why it's it's important to try to create a timeline of these banks and that way you could get an idea of where they were located, when they were established, um, when they merged or when they were taken over. And then you might be able to kind of narrow down what became of those records. Um, so yeah, certainly, I think, you know, some of them could have ended up at local historical societies and archives, and then there are others who might have retained those records. It's, um, I think it's kind of a, it's not like one or the other. It's definitely worth researching. Uh, and Diane asks for the Irish Immigrant Savings Bank, do any of the resources you mentioned hold a record or have kind of a complete set of the records um, and she says I'm especially interested in Ancestry do they have a complete set of the Irish Immigrant Savings Bank records so they have um, online in terms of the the account holders so the the um, the index and the test books and the uh, the transfer books they have a number of them online and as I mentioned in the lecture um, there are gaps so um, I think there's from like 80 to 83, 1880 to 1883, there's a, an, index books, uh, an index book that uh, is presumed missing because you have the transfer books that, um, that go to 1883. But they, uh, if you're looking for wider materials, if you're looking for stuff about the bank itself, whether it's annual reports or um, 
you know, uh, uh, more stuff about the trustees and the workings of the bank. Uh, those would be more in the manuscript collections. So NEHGS has them, um, New York Public Library. So it, the great thing is look for the finding aids or inquire with um, the repository that has the microfilm collection um, in the finding aid and they can give you more details about it. I know uh, the New York Public Library has an online finding aid um, that you could take a look at and you can get a feel and that might be able to give you an idea of where those are. All right, and um, Leah asks, what are waste books? You mentioned those briefly. Um, what is the purpose or intention behind a waste book? Yeah, so the waste books, um, they're more, they jotted down the information and then later on what they did was they transcribed that information. So it's a daily accounts, uh, the transactions, they were placed into what they called waste books. It was almost like having a notebook and you're writing down the information, but you want to have it, um, those details transferred into a ledger or another book, like the volumes um, that were more for the, um, the cleaner record keeping. So the waste books are just as interesting. They have a lot of information in there. Um, it's it's not extraneous information. It's just um, the the stuff that they were doing day to day. Um, so that's that's why they're just as important to check out. All right. And um, Carol asks, do you know if there were similar banks in Eastern Canada in the 1800s, and how might you go about kind of researching to see what might exist? Well, I think it's a matter of uh, offhand, I'm not sure, um, but I would start small and then expand out. Um, if you're honed in on a particular area, then I would research the history of that area. Um, and again, kind of as this, as if they're in a rural area, um, town and county histories, uh, you know, just try to learn about what uh, was produced afterwards. I would contact uh, libraries and archives in that area. Um, I'm sure that they would have great resources to point you towards to um, whether it's, you know, uh, certain directories or newspapers and such, and to try to glean more information and find out what's available there. And uh, Lucretia says, I, you know, I have a record of a relative writing a check on uh, Brown Brothers Harriman in the 1830s. This organization still exists. Should I write to them? Should I contact them? So if, you know, especially if the bank uh, that you know your ancestor um, attended or had an account in, if it still exists, how would you kind of go about uh, seeing what you might have access to? I think first what I would do is um, just take a look at Archive Grid and type in that company and see if you can come up with particular records. And then if you can't really find anything, then yeah, I would try to see if they have an archives division. If not, um, the area that they're located in or that they were located in at the time that um, the check was written. Again, I would uh, try to uh, track through local historical societies. You know, even um, local colleges, their libraries too. Um, you know, there might be a business library. So for instance, Harvard has a business library. There, there might be stuff in, um, you know, special collections in a particular library. So not just a town library or um, a, a county archives, you know, kind of get a feel for other, um, other repositories in that area. All right, maybe uh, just a few more questions before wrapping up. A few people have asked about, um, did, deposits and withdrawals have to be done in person or, I mean, could anything be transacted over the mail? Um, do you know kind of that those procedures, especially for kind of the 19th century? So I know early on, I mean, one of the big uh, ideas behind these books, uh, the, the writing of the information, uh, you know, the person has a lame hand, they stutter, uh, any scars, I've, I've seen information about scars, and then them being able to tell them information such as the names of next to kin, where they live, stuff like that, it's because they're coming in person and they're the record holder. They don't, um, you know, they, uh, they, they came in during those particular hours to do it. 
But what I would do is um, I've found a number of banks have anniversary pamphlets. Um, so, you know, um, there's like a hundred year anniversary uh, booklet that was made regarding the Provident Institution for Savings. Um, you know, I know that there's articles out there and it really gives you a, a detailed view of the the ins and outs of how the banks ran, uh, some of the procedures that the depositors um, had to follow. So I would I would look into that and kind of get a feel for it, um, more of that kind of um, direction. I mean, it's kind of funny. These are like the first security questions. I mean, it's what's your mother's yeah. maiden name and, <laughs> yeah. you know, what's, what's your, your favorite first dog or something. <laughs> Um, so it's, yep. it's kind of funny to see well, that. Did you, you know, come on. Exactly. Yeah. The information that you were supposed to know, your your brother's first name, that kind of thing. That's really funny. Yeah. Um, Instead of your first car. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then a few questions about, um, you know, if you're looking for an earlier period, so really before the, um, the establishment of some of these banks, if you're looking at in, say, the late 18th century, um, are there other records like account books or, you know, I don't know, other records that you might turn to to find similar information as far as um, transactions and uh, money being exchanged? Um, I mean, my focus has really been on the savings banks. So in terms of some of the earlier resources, I think I would just kind of um, look more into articles pertaining to the history of banking in the United States. Uh, I know like on JSTOR, uh, you might find certain books on Google Books or um, uh, Hath the Trust. Um, so you, you get like more of the history of it and then that way you could kind of identify, you know, this took place in Philadelphia, this took place in Boston in certain years, and then you can kind of get a feel for what was done in those areas during uh, particular time frames. So, um, you know, I would, I would kind of take a look backwards that way. All right. Well, thank you again, Eileen. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Um, I know we didn't get to everyone's question. If you do have more specific questions about your family history research, you may consider scheduling a consultation or hiring our research services team. You can learn more about those services by contacting the email addresses on your screen. I also want to let you know about a, um, an exciting recent expansion of our free online chat service. So you can live chat with one of our genealogists Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. So you still have an hour today if you have a question. Uh, this service is open to everyone. You do not have to be a member of American Ancestors. And uh, to access that service, just go to AmericanAncestors.org slash chat. So, and I will be also including all of this information, um, including a link uh, to the recording and a syllabus that you can purchase on our online bookstore. I will be including all that information in my follow-up email later today. So thank you again for joining us. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback. As we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. This free webinar was made possible by the generous support of members and friends around the world. Please consider making a gift to American ancestors to keep these programs free and to create more free programs for you and others. If you'd like to act access more how-to resources or learn about upcoming online educational programs, please visit our online learning center at AmericanAncestors.org slash education. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.